We are going to invite a panel to the stage that will discuss translational breast cancer research from the researchers, the clinicians, and a patient's point of view. To moderate the panel, we are joined by Cheryl Weedmark, a community journalist with a passion for health care. Cheryl is known in her work for television and radio. Her community involvement includes work with organizations such as Wellsprings London and Region, Dale Brain Injury Association, and 100 Women Who Care. She is currently working in the marketing communications at London Life Insurance as a video producer. Cheryl? It's going to be musical chairs today, Dr. Chambers. <laughs> I'm going to call you back up again. Uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Kylie Potvin. If Dr. Kylie would like to come up, and uh, we'll welcome her in a second. Dr. Potvin is a consultant medical oncologist at the London Regional Cancer Program, also an assistant professor in the Department of Oncology at Western University. She is the director of the Postgraduate Training Program in Medical Oncology and chair of the National Fellowship Committee of the Canadian Association of Medical Oncologists. Um, she has strong interests in patient advocacy and medical education, and she is also a classically trained opera singer. I'm not singing for you now. <laughs> that was my next question. Dr. Allison Allen, if you would like to come up, is a senior oncology scientist at the London Regional Cancer Program, London Health Sciences Centre, and the assistant director of the Pamela Greenaway Colmeyer Trans... Relational Breast Cancer Research Unit. Dr. Allen's research interests lie in the study of molecular mechanisms that influence normal cellular growth, tumor development, and cancer progression. Dr. Allison Allen used to ride horses competitively and has a passion for tennis. She is a Rafael Nadal fan, which us Federer fans will not hold against her today. <laughs> Dr. Ann Chambers is the Canada Research Chair in Oncology, a distinguished oncology scientist at the London Regional Cancer Program, and the director of the Pamela Greenaway Colmeyer Translational Breast Cancer Research Unit as well, as a professor of oncology at Western University. Dr. Ann Chambers started as a marine biologist researcher and spent a lot of her time researching marine life in Bermuda. And uh, Kelly Tranquilly, if I could ask you to come up again as well. A graduate of Carleton University in Ottawa with a Bachelor of Journalism, Kelly obtained her law degree with distinction from Western University in 1996. She is a partner at Learners, practicing in the areas of health and insurance litigation. London Health Sciences Centre has always been a special place for Kelly and her family, and she is honoured to have the opportunity to give back to this organisation. I would like to give everyone here a warm welcome, and thank you for coming today. We're going we're gonna to start with uh, Dr. Potvin. Um, Dr. Potvin, can you talk to us a little bit about how and, and what kind of progress has been made over the course of the last 10, 20, 30 years from your experience? So thankfully, I haven't been practicing for 30 years. <laughs> My anti-aging projects are helping that. No. Um, I have been practicing for close to 10 years, and um, I only have a few minutes to talk. We could be here all day if I were to tell you about the advances that we've made. I think the first really exciting thing is that we know that breast cancer survival rates are some of the best of any type of cancer, and they're getting better every single year. So from a pure statistical standpoint, we know it's a fact. But um, as a clinician who's been practicing this for the past 10 years, um, a few highlights. The first thing is, it's, I have a job with real tools to be able to help people because of the persistence and the passion that people like Allison and Anne give to us of their time. People have no idea how difficult and oftentimes discouraging it can be to do research. So, so what are some amazing things with breast cancer? So the first thing with any kind of cancer, cancer is a single label, and what we know because of research bench research is that it's a single label that represents a thousand rare diseases. So there has been a lot of research done looking at um, different subtyping of breast cancer now because they have different gene profiles. They behave very differently. And again, I could put 10 women in front of you with a diagnosis of breast cancer. How we would treat it would be quite different in all of them. How it would behave in all of them would be quite different just because we understand it is 
a uh, very heterogeneous disease. So that's been because of the work of researchers identifying these. And a perfect example, one of the biggest successes in oncology has been related to something called HER2 new positive breast cancer. So there's an absolutely fascinating story behind it that I don't have time to share with you, but the bottom line is this is a breast cancer that historically used to be one of the deadliest forms of breast cancer, but nobody ever knew why. And it wasn't until, because of the persistence of another researcher, an oncologist named Dennis Slayman, who figured out that it was this particular gene showing up in about 20% of breast cancers that led to it being so aggressive. So because they found the gene and its downstream effects, as a result, that breast cancer has gone from being one of the deadliest to one of the most curable breast cancers, and cu I mean curable. And that is because as a result, we've been able to design very specific treatments targeted against this kind of breast cancer. Um, and truly, in 2005, there were 10,000 people. I was in the audience at the presentation at our big international oncology meeting, and people were actually crying when the results of this, um, this data was published in early breast cancer. So um, deadliest disease to one of the most curable diseases as a result. Um, we are learning about more specific targets now to try to identify who are the patients that we need to treat in terms of preventive type of therapies as opposed to treating everybody and avoiding toxicities. So there's been absolutely tremendous, tremendous work done in this field. And like I said, the increased survival rates are a testament to this fact. So that being said, what are we doing moving forward? What's next in terms of research? So there's a lot of catchphrases thrown out there with regard to cancer and its treatment. And one that we hear a lot about is personalized care, personalized medicine. And I think that this is um, a direction that the work that you know, Dr. Allen and Dr. Chambers are doing are going to help us in different ways. And we actually have other people joining us here in London that are going to help us. We need to know who to treat. We need to know specifically with what to treat them and when we should treat them. And if we look at the early setting, ideally, if we can find markers, easily identifiable markers that will tell us who has deadly disease versus potentially not, because not all cancers are going to kill people, then we are going to be able to identify who needs treatment and then help us identify specifically what treatment they need. So those early markers are really, really important. And Dr. Allen is doing, Allison is, um, Allen is doing some really pioneering work in this. Secondly, it's what kills breast cancer patients. It's metastatic disease. We're not good enough yet. Um, we need to understand the disease better from a gene profile, how these diseases behave. We need to understand resistance to the current treatments that we're using. And so we need to be able to identify that disease. We need to be able to identify those patients as well. Why does this disease spread in some people and not others? How do we target that? How do we best treat it? And again, that's, that's absolutely essential work that uh, Dr. Chambers is contributing to. So. Um, we have the expertise, the people here to do this, and these are some of the most important areas of work that we're Excellent. looking Excellent. Thank you so much. And Dr. Allen, how has the research that you've been doing contributed to the work that Dr. Potvin was speaking about today? So I, <clears throat> I think that um, one of the things that London does really well that a lot of centers and a lot of research programs don't is that we focus on this aspect of metastasis. And so, <clears throat> despite the fact that the majority of deaths that occur from breast cancer, as Kylie said, are still, you know, we're getting really much better at treating specific types, early mm -hmm. disease, the majority of patients <clears throat> that die from their breast cancer will die from metastatic disease, but only a very small amount of effort and dollars, importantly, are going towards cancer research focused on metastasis. Um, the most of the funding is going towards looking at other things and has certainly made progress. So here in London, um, in the TBCRU, as well as citywide, we, <clears throat> we focus really on that. And so an example in my program, um, <clears throat> we do study the very basic science of why do cells metastasize? Why do they spread? Mm -hmm. um, we don't even understand that sometimes. So we study that. We try to figure out new proteins like HER2 so that we could identify new drugs. Um, but more sort of immediate to the patients, we're working very hard on developing blood tests for, um, <clears throat> for detecting metastasis as it happens in real time. And so <clears throat> in your body, uh, your bloodstream is kind of like a highway. So it's like the 401. The tumor cells, <clears throat> the tumor cells need they need that highway to spread and to go to distant organs, to the lung, to the liver, to the brain. 
And this blood test, we think of it sort of as the traffic cop to sort of catch the bad guys, catch the speeders, identify them early so that we can hopefully stop them, do something about them, stop them from doing more damage. Um, so we've, we're very pleased that this year, um, in January actually, we partnered with Clinical Lab Services to actually move one of these tests into the clinic uh, here at LHSC. Um, and in the next few years, we hope it's going to be actually available to um, all patients here and also across Canada. Um, and the other thing in when we go back to the lab is that we're working on, um, you know, characterizing how, you know, Kylie said she can put 10 women in front of you and they'll have 10 different diseases. So this blood test, we want to be able to say to each woman, your breast cancer has these specific characteristics and that means that you are eligible for this drug and we know that it will work in you and we can get to that drug right away instead of kind of guessing and some of, because some of the older drugs are very toxic. Um, so this blood test is helping us not only sort of see those speeders but also figure out exactly what it is that makes them so bad and sort of nip them in the bud. Mm -hmm. So um, we're very excited um, certainly here at LHSC through the funding of the um, Breast Cancer Society and the collaborative nature of the hospital. Um, it's been extremely rewarding for me as a scientist to be able to see an idea go all the way from, you know, um, in the bench to all the way to benefiting patients. And so I'm very lucky to be, you know, a scientist here, um, a scientist in London, and to be supported by the Breast Cancer Society of Canada. Thank you, Dr. Allen. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Chambers now. How has the TBCRU program specifically contributed to the benefits that breast cancer patients have been able to see? We fund seed funding, we fund studentships, we have a few other programs as well, and this was created with the vision that we developed with the Greenaways. What we require of the applications for both programs is that they have a path set out that can take the research to the patient. Some of it has a very direct path, some of it is more indirect. Some of the more direct ones are medical imaging or work that people are doing to try to protect vital organs from radiation damage by using special imaging techniques. We fund things that have to do with um, bacteria and breast cancer, and that's a, a New growing area. We fund genomic research in breast cancer. We fund, as Allison said, a lot of research on different aspects of why do cancer cells spread and how do you stop them? What drugs can we develop? What timings can we figure out that will help use these drugs at the right, right time and place? Similarly, for the, the seed funding program, they have to have a path that sets where the research is going to go in terms of the patients. For both of the programs, We've been very good at leveraging the dollars. So Allison, for example, got a $25,000 seed funding grant. She got preliminary data. She then took that to a big agency and she got a half a million dollar grant for that. That wouldn't have happened if she didn't have the preliminary data. Similarly, a lot of our students will We'll fund them for a year or so. Then they'll be much more competitive having publications and, and uh, productivity to go and compete for CAHR training programs that then sustain them for the rest of their graduate career. So we've, we've done a very collaborative sort of thing in London. We've made the decision to fund citywide and that's helped bring the whole community together in terms of interactions, ma making new collaborations, that sort of thing. So I, I, I'm very proud of what we've done so far and I look forward to coming years. We'll, we'll move and talk a little bit more about the patient perspective, um, Kelly. So from, from your point of view, how has the bench to bedside research been able to help in terms of your recovery? Uh, great question. Uh, I have to tell you when I first uh, sat down with Anne and Allison and heard about uh, Pamela's story, I uh, was moved uh, beyond anything because I realized that just by the simple passage of 10 years um, I could have been her and that because of the legacy and courage uh, of your daughter and and the Greenaway family uh, there are people like me I'm just one patient of thousands that pass through the cancer program uh, but you've made a difference in so many lives uh, as you heard Dr. Potvin say that we've just had such incredible um, 
uh, discoveries and advances in survivability uh, in the last 10 years, and I want you to keep working on that. <laughs> uh, in, in my particular experience, what, what I witnessed was what we have um, a true gift in here with this center is when you have, um, you got the medical front line who has direct access and collaboration with the science frontier. It's all happening in one place. There is a constant sharing of information. Uh, so rather than, in my case, uh, waiting for advances to percolate through conferences and boards and, and, and new decisions on what standardized treatment should mean, I had an oncologist who had direct access and was coming back uh, to, to the uh, clinics and calling me up and saying, you know, we've, we've restudied your pathologies, we've, we've run it again, and we've just found out some exciting news, and we'd like to change up your treatment. Here's all the data. We've all discussed it and, and reviewed your case, uh, and we would really, uh, we really invite you to participate in this treatment. That's all I needed to hear. Uh, and so certainly I benefited from the incredible advances right in the early stages of my treatment with HER2. Uh, and then with some further advances a couple of years later uh, when I was just about finished with the program and uh, they, they, they made some further discoveries. So keep it up. <laughs> Kelly, why do you think it's important then that, that the researchers and the clinicians communicate and work collaboratively together? Well, in some ways probably these three are better uh, equipped to answer it than me, but from what I witnessed, it's, it's the fact that my oncologist was able to immediately act on information rather than working, uh, waiting for a conference or a journal article could come through and to discuss it at another meeting or, or society symposium and debate it. Uh, there was a full round table available to him where all of this information could be shared immediately and so start making a difference right away. Um, when you're in a situation like me and, and so many others who have been through the journey that are, have joined us today, you don't necessarily have the luxury of waiting a year uh, to find out um, whether this is the new thing. Um, so that's, that's what I've seen and that's what I've experienced. Can I comment on that Absolutely, as well? Dr. Chambers. So fr from a scientist perspective, it's really important for us to have physicians because when we read about something or have an idea, it's really important to be able to go to a physician and say, if I did this, would this be useful to you? Sometimes they'll say no, because I wouldn't be able to use that information. Other times they sort of steer what you're doing and say, well, it would really be useful if you could do this instead. It, it's very much a two-way street. We need to know what the medical needs are now, and we need to help explain what we can do so that physicians can then think about where we can go. And it, it's a very interactive two-way street, and you need to be in the same city, the same building, running into each other over coffee, that sort of thing. We are going to open it up to everyone who has any questions for any of our experts today, but maybe Dr. Potvin, you wanted to comment on that from, from a doctor's perspective? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, if the words collaboration, collaborative, every variation of the theme has been thrown out here and it's 100% uh, accurate and what Anne is saying is, is very true. I mean, you need both. Like, we need the researchers, but we need the patients um, and then the interaction between, which is the physicians. You just, one doesn't happen without the other. You can have all the discoveries on the bench that you want, but if we can't get that out to the patients to actually test this in in the patient population, we'll never get that answer. So, um, and as Anne said, it's, you know, when you're working on different sides of that fence, knowing what is feasible for the same thing for us, because sometimes, you know, the way things happen, it's observations in clinic, like something happens, you think about it, and then, but we have to ask them, hey, you know, what do you think of this idea? Can we do this? Is, do we have the resources? So, it just cannot happen in isolation. And the other thing I would say is, um, Kelly's a perfect example of this. Patients are extremely savvy and educated today. And it's a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes, but in essence, it's really a good thing because they come in informed, but it also means they often come in asking us to participate in, in research, asking us, what is going on here? What are you doing? So um, that is really crucial. And for me as a clinician to actually have that opportunity here is, it's a huge benefit for our patients. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Allen. So I, I just wanted to um, sort of add in that a lot of people in the public who are not in research think that this model of collaboration is, it's logical, right? It makes sense. 
So, of course, everyone is doing it. But I just want to emphasize that not everyone is doing it, and that's one of the things that makes London very unique and world class. And so, for example, our neighbors down the road in Toronto, they're scattered all over the city. Um, a lot of times the scientists are not anywhere near clinicians. We work, I think, more with some Toronto clinicians than they actually work with people in their own city because they know that, the, that we're used to that model. So this is a really unique thing for London. And the other thing I wanted to mention is just the geography of us being located directly in the same building as the patient care. This means that Anne and I walk in every day through the treatment center and you know, once or twice a month, I will see a young woman, you know, the same age as me, the same age as Kai. Kylie sees this probably every day. And they have children the same age as mine. And I think, my God, like that could be me, that could be my sister, that could be my friend. And that's just, it's incredibly motivating. It just puts in a sense of urgency for us to do you know, to work hard and to do relevant research. I'm, I'm still amazed at all the research that's happening. I, I didn't even know about it until I started getting involved in this, so it's excellent. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions for any of our panel members about anything that we've discussed today, now would be the time. We do have some people with some microphones as well that will come around and um, do that. Where are the microphone people? Yeah, there's one over there. Um, maybe we can actually just ask a couple more questions and then if anyone does have any questions you can sort of find the point people if you guys want to just make yourself available. Um, Dr. Allen I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the other ways that you connect with clinicians and if you can give us an example of uh, perhaps maybe a question or an, or an observation at the bedside that has resulted as a has happened as a result of this I guess. So yeah certainly um, as Anne said as scientists, we interact with the clinicians, but our, you know, the, the trainees who are supported through the TBCRU. Um, for example, I have um, two trainees who are co-supervised by clinicians. So this means that um, these students, as they're up and coming, they're learning, um, you know, they're learning this model as they go around. And the, the hope is that they're going to pay it forward. You know, when they become a grown-up scientist, they're going to go and they're going to, wherever they get hired, and they're going to say, this is the way we need to do research. This is the way we need to make a difference. So we work in that way. And um, I think certainly others in, in our unit have done that as well. Um, so an example is Eva Turley, who, um, you know, is just chatting with one of our radiation oncologists who had observed um, a lot of um, skin problems with patients who were receiving radiation. And Eva sort of said, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm researching this, this protein called HA, and we know from other applications that it actually works really well for skin. And so a partnership became available in a clinical trial um, to sort of help that. So that, you know, that goes to the quality of life issue and, and just, you know, chatting in the hall or as we interact with our students, with each other, these ideas just come and and you know we sort of go our separate ways, do our own expertise, and come together to solve a problem. Okay, um, Dr. Chambers, I have one question to you. Just a little bit about the funding model with the society and how that differs from traditional grant money, because we've sort of talked about both today a little bit. Well, th this actually was part of the the interactions that the Greenaways and I had originally. Well, they started out, of course, small, and we tried to run grant funding programs, and the administration behind that was unworkable. So we needed a new model. And what we thought was if we could get stable funding in London for a series of programs, and then for each of those programs provide internal peer review, that would get rid of the administration problem, and that would give us a continuity so that we know that our studentship program will continue each year so that we can continue to support students. We know that the seed funding program will continue each year so that we can get people thinking now of you have a good idea, we'll work it up into a grant and you can apply twice a year competitions. Both of those programs are peer reviewed by us and it counts on the Breast Cancer Society of Canada trusting us to use this lump sum in a flexible but appropriate manner. So our, our bottom line is, is this the best use of donor dollars and that, that we apply to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to up and coming next generation researchers, uh, maybe we can touch on that. And I know the TBCRU is very keen on supporting that. Um, so how important is, is 
donor funding in that regard? It's absolutely crucial. I mean, being a student is a hard thing. Being a graduate student is a costly endeavor. It requires a lot of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. If we can provide some stable funding so that they can attend school, they can work in a lab, then they're supported in what they're trying to do. And hopefully they'll get inspired by the, the translational model that we have here. I'm looking at Donna Murrell. I'm, I'm thinking as a student example, uh, we funded her for, I guess, one year. She now has a three, four year scholarship. And she's, she's doing some work on, with Dr. Paula Foster on brain metastasis and better ways to detect them in the clinic. So the, she started with work in mice. And now there's a clinical trial that's been set up with a lot of the physicians and physicists here that's testing whether her ideas are in fact going to give better diagnosis of brain metastases for breast cancer patients. So I, I think the, the funding is, is just crucial. That's amazing. No questions yet? No? Um, was there anything that you ladies wanted to add at all to anything we've discussed today before we go from a patient perspective, clinician, researcher? Uh, just Thank something you. that I particularly learned from uh, speaking with uh, Anne and Allison that I think is so exciting just for cancer generally is that a lot of the work and advances that are being made within the TBCRU uh, lend themselves to treatment in other forms of cancer. So um, this in the big picture is really not just about breast cancer, it's about uh, dealing with all forms of the illness. So there's just so much exciting that's going on here. Thank you so much. And we should give these ladies a round of applause again before we wrap up. The Breast Cancer Society of Canada, the researchers, the Pamela Greenaway Colmeyer Translational Breast Cancer Research Unit and London Health Sciences Foundation have a unique and collaborative relationship, as you can see, which is the model of funding supported and repeated by BCSC across Canada.